thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for uh, being here to listen. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, again for their very gracious invitation to me and I hope uh, my small contribution will be of interest. I start with a verse from the Quran. It's the 70th verse of the 17th chapter. Bismillah ar-Rahman Walaqad karamna bani Adama. The translation roughly of which is, and we have honored the children of Adam. Now, in order to fulfill the aim of this paper, so uh, it's twofold, to problematize the question of what does it mean to be or to be a human, and to find an open, the second point being to find an opening for a conversation between different traditions outside of the hegemon, uh, we need to assume that current human rights discourse uh, is understood not just to be problematic, but actually a tool of oppression. So it's not just that Western countries are hypocritical in their criticisms of human rights violations or that they also abuse human rights, but that the terms, the inherent ideas, even the malleability of the terms, which rest in the hands of the dominant only, violate, violate any claims to just outcomes. I speak now as an activist, and oftentimes uh, activists for justice. We want to make human rights real. You know, we want to wrest them away, wrestle them away from the hypocrisy of the powerful. But what happens when we try to do that, and it's this is not to de undermine any struggle, is that without realizing it, a lot of the problems of the hypocrisy that we're trying to bring down, of the actual imbalance of power that we're challenging, lies not in the misapplication of human rights norms and, just, and terms, but actually in the very words themselves. I've written a lot about this elsewhere, about the hows and the whys, and I think my colleagues here on the panel have also done so, and. and in a, to a much better standard than myself, so I won't go into too much detail here. I want to give one example, which uh, I inserted very late in the day into this uh, paper because it just happened in the last two weeks, and that is a decision at the European Court of Human Rights regarding the face covering ban in France that was enacted in 2010. Now, I'm highlighting this for two reasons, the first being about the control of meaning. Now, I, I think I don't need to tell the audience here that there is an unwritten norm, and it inheres with the idea of the human, the Cartesian God complex or God I view of man that has uh, come out of the last several hundred years of so-called rationality. And that is within human rights discourse. There is a hierarchy of the individual over community, over gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's an unwritten, but it's an accepted norm. And this is why uh, you will have, for example, big human rights organizations like Amnesty focusing on the non-violent prisoner of conscience. Although things have changed a bit now, but that's the kind of predominant focus and less so on things like, for example, the prison industrial complex. But this emphasis on the individual is then also the reason why a woman in France who wants to cover her face uh, due to Islamic traditions uh, felt she can make a complaint to the European Court of Human Rights as an individual whose rights have been violated under various articles. In that case, the judgment uh, by majority that came out in the last fortnight went against her and supported the French government. And the point here is this, that it's not that they said there was no discrimination. They accepted that there was violation of her rights by the law. What they found in favor of the French government was the idea that it was necessary because the French government has the discretion to set the criteria of the terms of living together. This is the quote. Now, <clears throat> in order to determine this, basically the judgment found that the French uh, government's claim was that that majority of people who, uh, well, the people who constitute the majority were a group of individuals who on an individual level would feel violated, their feelings would be hurt by seeing a person covering, or specifically a Muslim woman covering her face because this would deny them the possibility of having an interpersonal communication with her if they wanted it. Okay. So on the one hand, you have a majority group becoming individual and thus becoming a model French citizen. And at the same time, the individual whose rights are acknowledged to have been violated and for whom human rights discourse apparently exists at this level, being stripped of her individual agency again, okay, this time by the very interpretation of the letter of the law, <coughs> 
in order to fulfill this criteria. So we are back to square one, okay, as a racialized minority within a minority within a minority. You're de facto uh, shorn of your agency. You have no individuality even when you try to have individuality within the terms that are set out as your rights. And you're always uh, shorn of your group identity. The group identity has no kind of legitimacy and therefore you are an, a powerless mass, okay? And your existence either has to be moderated, controlled, assimilated, or else, as this judgment does, excluded. Okay, so it's because whatever we do, we're not constituted as fully or just as human in a discourse that hails from this Cartesian rationality and all the problems that are in here is we don't need to open it up again. There was a dissenting judgment in this case too, and if there is time, I'll refer to it later because although obviously it found in favor of, these, of this applicant, it too has got some problems in the way it then tries to seek out justice for her. So if we're going to problematize this, if we're going to get beyond this, uh, what do we have to do? And now as a human rights activist for the you know, last 20 something years, I, get, I have gotten to a point where many of us have that we have to start dispensing with certain terms, the first of which being human, the second being rights, not because we don't believe in justice, but because of all the problems that keep coming with these terms, whether they're entirely philosophical, whether they come through the operation of the law. And this I can highlight through some of the problems we have in recent uh, Islamic thinking and traditions. And in particular, there are many ulama. Ulama is another word which gets mistranslated a lot, but you could say scholars or clerics or learned people, who will highlight again and again that whenever the Quran and traditions are translated, they're translated not just into specific nominal terms, but they inhere the meanings. So human, this problematic human, becomes inserted into the meaning of the Quran and then translated back to us and we are taught our traditions through a completely different frame of reference that didn't exist there before. And what we have seen in the last century in particular, but uh, in different places and different times, I cannot refer to all the different sort of thinkers and writers, so I'll just probably focus on Sheikh Al-Asi, who's contemporary, and uh, Murta Mutahiri, who's uh, from the sort of 60s and 70s, is an attempt to within the Islamic tradition, go back to roots and bring those meanings back to an application in a contemporary, I won't say modern for obvious reasons, context. Now, Arsi contends that there's no equivalent language of human rights and it's important. You know, he's against and so am I, this, uh, which is ironic for somebody from the Islamic Human Rights Commission, but anyway, against the translation of that term into any other language for all the reasons I've said before. He says for there to be a concept of human rights, there must be a concept of human wrongs. And this is alien to an uh, Islamic conception of what it means to exist. Okay, now Michael Ignatieff, who's a, an apologist for the, uh, what he would describe as the liberal roots of the human rights discourse, in a very frank uh, apologia, human rights as politics and idolatry actually concedes this. He says that human rights exist to basically con to contain the inherent wrongs that man are born with. Man, again, man, emphasis, is born with. So in this worldview, which is what under underlies the law and the, con the concept of the subject of the law, okay, we have a man who's born to deviance. And he's not just born to deviance, he's only really understood as that by that Cartesian man. So if you don't accept that, you yourself are not fully constituted as a valid subject of that law because you basically don't understand what's good for you and what's right for you. For the translators, I'm skipping a little bit. If that's the case then, we need to, or these, authors have argued to insert old and new frameworks. And that goes back to the verse that I quoted at the beginning. And this is very key to opening up the conversation. I think we've heard many things about this already this morning from different traditions, which 
show the opportunity of completely obviating what we are stuck with, this language that we're continuously trying to negotiate about human rights. We have indeed, the quote said, dignified the children of Adam. RC explains that this confers a minimum degree of dignity, okay, that can't be violated by anyone. So it applies to every creation. But also, in the particularity of being a Muslim and being a believer, it actually puts the responsibility on you who believe in this as the divine revelation to ensure the dignity of every human being. So there is a positive obligation to go out there and do something. But again, we're still stuck. What is it? What is this human? Who is it that we are dignifying? Is it the same man who's considered to be at the core bad? This is where we have the interruption of the conversation by the concept of, concept of insan, which is always translated as man and humanity in very sort of Euro-American translations, and I'm sure other Euro Eurocentric translations. Insan, and this goes to the title of my presentation, is neither of those words. It expresses a description of being, and the roots of all of this are quite distinct from the roots of what it means to be a human, a man, an individual in this sense. At its core, it means, <clears throat> excuse me, social being. Okay, that in some, as the description of quote unquote humanity is actually a description of an interconnectedness of existence between individuals and peoples. And within that, it's not just a case of, I am connected with the other. There is no other by which you can determine yourself as I. Okay, there are only multiple connections. What has happened, and we've seen this time and again in the battle over the very real political battles that happen when there are kind of quote unquote Islamic or Islamist or whatever you want to describe the movements, is the socialization of some of these terms back to that hegemonic norm, which means ultimately some of these movements move away from South-South conversations or you know, get trapped in the idea of just trying to find recognition and liberation through a traditional liberal nation state mechanism, which as we have seen in the very recent past, are doomed to fail. Part of insan, again, is to familiarize yourself as well. It's not just a case of accepting each other, it's about having familiarity. And this goes to a key idea of difference within these texts, and Mutahari in particular brings this up, and Mutahiri is important because he came at a time when there was a huge move towards uh, essentially liberation movements in particularly Iran, but also Turkey and other parts of the Muslim world, to a lesser extent in Malaysia and Indonesia. He highlights uh, another ayah which may, a verse which many people have probably heard, and again is mistranslated so many times I can't even go into the amount of mistranslations in one verse. Roughly, the translations go something like this, oh mankind, we've dealt with mankind. We have created you male and female, and have made you nations and tribes that you may know one another. Lo, the noblest of you in the sight of Allah is the best in conduct. So I will pick up on just three of the mistranslations, two of which, nations and tribes. Again, this has been retaught to different constituencies through the lens of what is a nation and what is a tribe. We don't have to unpick it here. We know what the problems are with those terms. The actual words, shu'ub and qabayl, talk about things coming from the source, shu'ub, and things which are uh, running in parallel to that. And I haven't got time to explicate, uh, explain all of this. RC does this in many works as to how these descriptions are a description of the human family, if you like, human again. But with equality and parity and difference and a varied experience, but never in the sense of superior, inferior, or of subalternization. Within that, there's a sense of dignity and equality. And this is the interruption of that narrative that has is being fought over in many practical instances we can bring up in the Q&A. The, the other mistranslation I will highlight is lit'arifu, which is to know. And again, it brings us back to the issue of knowing. Somebody said it very succinctly, this, uh, very beautifully this morning about uh, listening but not hearing. 
Knowing is not knowing in the sense that we understand it in terms of a coloniality of knowledge. Knowing is about understanding each other. Again, reciprocity and mutuality, again, inherent when you go back to roots in these words. So if we are dispensing with human rights, what do we have? It's easy to say just justice, but these are the core terms. And I think these, comes up in, these terms come up in many traditions. We have al-adl, we have al-qist. Ad is justice and al-qist is social justice. Uh, and this is a big departure which I clearly don't have time to go into. What I want to highlight though is also within this discourse, something that I think is uh, often an underwritten concern when we talk about big traditions, albeit traditions that have lost their momentum. And that is, what is it that stops this discussion becoming another universalizing discourse? And Mutahari highlights this, and he was somebody who pushed for this sort of South-South conversation, highlighting how to deal with what is essentially, uh, within the Quranic terms, what is seen to be a universal end for society, for the world society, and the kind of common future, or a messianic end to history, if you like. But he will quote, for example, verses which talk and emphasize perception, difference, and the need to under, that people have to understand values according to their own ideas. So, unto every nation, we have made their deeds seem fair. This is where he explains in quite a lot of detail, and I don't have time to go into here, as to how he makes that the focus of the conversations that need to be had. It's a narrow, there is a unit aspect of universalism there, and we're trapped with the words of universalism, particularism as well. But it is a narrow one, and it encompasses the idea of different journeys towards the good. And journeys is the operative word, not imposition. There's one other part of this that Mutahari highlights, and that is about the idea of Ummah. And Ummah, we te generally tend to think of it, and it's a correct idea as the unity of Muslim peoples around the world. However, taking him further, there is an aspect of Ummah, which jars against the idea of an in what we call, or I have termed the enlightenment test, which is something that, if you like, precedes that whole judgment uh, in the European Court of Human Rights that I started with, this idea that you have to accept certain things before you can be recognized as an individual and therefore be a rights bearer, uh, without which you end up inevitably being cast as the violator. And this is the idea that you, there is no compulsion in belief, which is a direct quote from the Quran. You can opt in or you can opt out, but that is a different matter to how uh, your journey is within this conversation. So, sorry, I lost my place. By opting in, you would then take on moral, legal, social, and political provisions that a believer has, but that you can also opt out, okay? There is no enlightenment test. I often at this point talk about uh, a feminist theory, theorist called Sandra Harding, and it fits in again with what has happened in this decision in France. She uh, critiques those of us who would uh, reject certain, uh, certain aspects, if not all aspects, of positivist feminism by saying, is it really acceptable, and this is the actual dilemma of many of the courts, that a woman who has not had the benefit of enlightenment values could be allowed to give them up without knowing what they are like. Okay. This is where this idea of ummah and the inter-community and interpersonal communications and intercultural communications as well as the intra-community within Muslim communities conversations cuts out this need for having to pass a test. There is parity, there are conversations, there will be difference, there will be disagreement, but it's not a club, okay? It's a movement, it's a journey. Just a... Uh, are you waving at me? Just to end, my apologies to the translators, I skipped a, a huge chunk. If we are to uh, move beyond this, and this is where my second departure on the European Court of Human Rights dissenting judgment comes in, 
how do we speak? What is it that we take and say from our traditions? Now, the dissenting judgment, the judgment of two of the judges, which supported the applicant in that case, basically set out the idea that the French government or any government does not have the ability to set out the terms of living together. This is kind of a ridiculous thing, and there shouldn't be that kind of uh, ability, amongst other arguments, to prescribe that. But yet, traditions, many, many traditions, are very prescriptive, and it's, in fact, the thing that is used to berate us and put us down and call us pre-modern, etc. And these are things that I have termed as social rights, rights as in R-I-T-E-S, as being part of the process of revisiting the idea of human rights. Because there are many things in many traditions that you have to do, that you do to be good, to retain your innate goodness, and to enact what needs to be done to achieve the good. Now, whether that's the way you care for the environment, the way you protect resources, the way you share, whether it's respecting your elders, whether it's uh, sharing wealth and sharing it again and sharing it again until injustice is eradicated. These are all things that we must do. These are things which actually come from many traditions and are, in a way, a criteria of not just living together, but actually helping each other. And that's a part which we often tend, in the world of human rights, to ignore, because human rights become something to contain and to actually prevent or to punish in the event of a violation, in a very narrow sense. As movements and as conversations, we need to be able to actually opt into the idea that it's not just that we say things and we listen to each other, but that we are allowed to do things as well and do them because we must do them. Uh, this conversation has to be had between those of us who are decolonizing, and we must really realize that to do and to prescribe in a way, not just to say things which are good, are essential tools in bringing about not just grammars of dignity, but the guaranteeing of dignity itself. Thank you.